Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Turning to Mary, the mother of the Lord, and our mother, together let's pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. O Mary, conceived without sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heaven and hell. You can't get more basic than that. This conference this weekend is what uh, you might call good old-fashioned, down-to-earth, straightforward, in-your-face Catholicism. You can't get any more basic than that. As I have said innumerable times in my preaching over the last ten years, at the end, when the dust settles and the smoke of this battle is blown away and time gives way to eternity, you and I are going to be one of two things, a winner, or a loser, heaven or hell. It's just that simple. You can't get around it. You can't change it. It is what it is. And so I'm going to speak to you in a rather simple way, which is the only way I know how this weekend, uh, continuing my, uh, my vocational trail. Uh, you remember what happened after I received my doctorate, right? After 10 years of studying in universities, I was about to receive my doctorate in theology, and the professor, the theologian who had directed my doctoral thesis on that day asked me, now, uh, Father, now that you've finished, you know, you have five university degrees now, at what level will you teach? And of course, he was expecting me to say in the seminary or Catholic university. Uh, of course, that's not the answer I gave him. I didn't have to think about it. It was reflexive. At what level will you teach? Kindergarten. <laughs> and I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, the basics are the most important. We have generations of Catholics who have not gotten the basics. And so it's a back to basics weekend. Let me begin by reading to you in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, verse 31 and following. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, Escorted by all the angels of heaven, he will sit upon his royal throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him. Then he will separate them into two groups, as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. The sheep he will place on his right hand, the goats on his left. The king will say to those on his right, Come. You have my Father's blessing. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, Out of my sight you condemned into that everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's the gospel. That's the good news, although it may not sound so good to some people. It's basic Christian truth. You can't get away from it. There have been contemporary attempts uh, masquerading under the specious pretext of scholarship that have tried to evade the issue, that have tried to explain it away. 
I don't like to tell you my old jokes, but I will anyway. <laughs> Some of you have heard these a dozen times or more, uh, but they fit. And this one just fits. It just fits. Probably the first time that I ever preached in the United States uh, as a newly ordained priest, I was invited to a big conference, although not as big as this one. There were quite a few people there. Uh, someone, one of the speakers had uh, taken sick and they had to fill in the slot. Uh, somehow they found out about me. Nobody had ever heard of me. I was just out of the university. But somebody said, well, there's this, uh, this priest, uh, newly ordained by the Pope. He's just got a doctorate in theology. He's probably not doing anything. Let's invite him. <laughs> and so it, so it happened. And I went to this conference. I didn't know anybody there. They didn't know me. And the keynote speaker uh, was giving his main address. And I sat up in the front. I was going to go on next. And it went rather like this. Now, you know, we don't really believe in angels anymore. You realize that angels are merely a literary device used in sacred scripture to illustrate a point. There was an elderly woman sitting in the front row. She leaned over to her friend and whispered in her ear, I wish one of those literary devices would come down and kick his butt. <laughs> he went on. And we don't really believe in the devil, and we don't really believe in purgatory anymore. That involves suffering. God could never have that. And certainly, we do not believe in hell. Well, finally he finished. He went down, wouldn't you know, he sat right next to the old lady. <laughs> now, she had reached that age where she just didn't care. You know about that age? You know about that age. Me too. Finally, she couldn't stand it anymore, and she leaned over to the priest and whispered in his ear, Father, you don't believe in hell. And he said, oh, no, my dear. She shrugged her shoulders and said, well, you'll believe it when you get there. <laughs> it's very simple. In your face truth. And a lot of people don't like it today. It's just the way it is. Winner, loser, heaven, hell. Have you heard the term eschatology? Some of you have heard that term. Eschatology, the end things. That's the branch of theology that has to do with the study of judgment, purgatory, heaven, and hell. I've just named my four talks. Judgment, purgatory, heaven, hell. Now, I have changed the order. We had hell for the last one, but since I don't want to end in hell, <laughs> heaven will be the last talk. <laughs> Judgment. Now, the gospel passage I just read to you is pretty clear. Now, I understand that there are people who don't like clarity. Their favorite color is gray. Nothing can be black and white. Jesus said, say yes when you mean yes, and no when you mean no, and all else is from the evil one. Our Lord wanted clarity, and he spoke clearly. When the Son of Man comes, escorted by all his angels, he's going to separate them in two groups. Who's, who's the them? Us. All humanity. Separated into two groups. Sheep and goats. The good guys and the bad guys. The ones who did it God's way, and the ones who did it their own way. The devil's way. Two groups. Judgment. 
there will be a judgment. The truth is integral. It's a very simple unity. Any element of the truth is part of the whole truth. And the truth, absolutely speaking, all truth which truly is subsists in him who is the truth, God. God is the truth. For me to give you four talks on these topics, uh, it's rather difficult to give four, four talks on any topic because you're, you're kind of taking things out of the context of all the truth, and I can't give you um, 50 talks like we have in my catechism series in, in one day or so. So we have to do the best we can. I have to assume certain things. Now, I'm getting older by the minute, which means I don't have time for silliness. Now, I realize that there are people who are apt to say, oh, I don't believe in judgment. I don't believe in purgatory. I would not broadcast what element of the faith you have apostatized on. When you say you don't believe this, you don't believe that, stop it. Get over that. Believe what the church believes. The church believes in judgment, particular judgment. As soon as you check out, you're going to be judged by Jesus Christ, a just judge, but a merciful judge. But you have to understand that at that time, when you pass from time into eternity, time for mercy is over. Time for judgment. There will be purgatory, hell, heaven. Those are the four elements of the last things. Judgment, purgatory, heaven, hell. All four of which are doctrinal certainties. Not my mere personal opinion. If you are Catholic, you must believe these things. You don't have to understand them. You just have to believe them. There's no place in this book where it says without understanding it is impossible to please God. But it does say without faith it is impossible to please God. Now you know what faith is, don't you? You know what faith... Now you're all good Catholics here. If I called on someone to answer that simple question, give me the, the definition of the theological virtue of faith, you could do it, couldn't you? Who shall I call upon? Everybody's hiding. <laughs> no, I know you know it, but for the sake of the two people in this room who don't know, I'm going to give it to you. Faith is the theological virtue by which you believe in God, believe all that God has said and revealed to us, believe everything Holy Church proposes for our belief, because he who has revealed it is truth itself. That is faith the theological virtue of faith. We believe all that God has revealed to us. We believe all that Holy Church proposes for our belief. That includes judgment, both particular and general judgment. That includes purgatory. That includes heaven and hell. We believe. Why do we believe? Because God, who is truth itself, has revealed it to us. He can neither deceive nor be deceived. You've got to talk about sin and grace when you talk about judgment. But obviously I don't have time to give a big dissertation on sin and grace. I, I have to assume certain things with you. And in my old age, I have to assume that you Catholics, and most of you are Catholics, you believe, you accept what the church teaches about sin and grace. Now, the Pope, when I, when I was born, what seemed like um, a, a, a big distance from here, in 1947, Buffalo, we always used to talk about Buffalo. <laughs> when, I, when I grew up in Hudson, New York, 
We always talk about Buffalo. That was like the furthest end of the galaxy. That was like six hours away. Man, that was a long trip back then. And if you went there, you would have to go through at least 10 feet of snow. Most all year round. And so I got off the plane and it was 70 degrees. Sin. It's a reality. In 1946, the year before I was born, Pope Pius XII gave a radio address to the Catechetical Congress meeting in the United States. And he said a very um, important thing, and it's been repeated so many times. It was quoted in encyclicals, it was quoted by the Second Vatican Council, quoted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. The sin of the century, this was the 20th century, was the loss of the sense of sin. In other words, we deny that we're sinners. We become so desensitized that we think we're okay. I'm okay, you're okay. Even if we're committing the most outrageous mortal sins. We've become desensitized. You don't believe me? Hey, wait, wait a second. Now, I'm, I, with these lights, I can't see very well, but I can see that two or three of you are older than me. <laughs> Not too many, but there's a couple here and there. Think for a moment what it was like when television first came in in our country. You remember that, don't you? Remember when you got your first television? I remember it. My grandparents got the, the they had the first television in our family. And remember how innocent television was back in the early 50s? I mean, how bad could it be? Howdy doody. <laughs> right? Kukla, Fran, and Ollie? All right, Milton Berle? It was, it was pretty wholesome stuff. That was then. Think about what we've got now. And, and that's only a 50-year span of time. One of our, what we consider one of our American saints, Sister Elizabeth Ann Seton, saw in a vision a black box through which Satan would enter every household in America. I wonder what the black box was. Mm. Yeah, television, no doubt. We've got to acknowledge sin, the existence of it. There are mortal sins, venial sins. That's basic stuff. God gives every human being sufficient grace to be saved. That's a fact. Every human being has been given, will be given, sufficient grace to be saved. There's a law written in the heart of man, the natural law, which mirrors the divine law. The voice of conscience echoes that law. Do good. Avoid evil. That's the basic moral law. When we make proper use of the intellect and the will, we go in the right direction. Our mind is made for truth. And our mind is restless until it rests in the truth. And of course, that truth is gone. Uh, our heart, our will, is made for love. But not just any love. Uh, that self-sacrificing love which desires the highest and best thing for the sake of the beloved. In other words, if I love you, and I do, I have to desire one thing for you, heaven. I have to desire that you make it to heaven, that you get through this battlefield alive, so to speak. You know, I, I've always, I've, I speak in the context of war, whether there's one going on or not. I've always been that way. That's what I understand. And that's the way God deals with me. 
I'm sure we wish that all of our military men and women come home safely. Our prayers accompany them. And regardless of how you feel about this particular war with Iraq, I'm sure that you wish our servicemen and women well. I'm sure you pray for them. You want them to get safely through that battlefield and come home. Now, I have just described love. I want you, every one of you, to get through this battle safely and get home to heaven. Anything other than that is irrelevant. If you should inherit the entire universe and all it contains, but lose your everlasting soul, what have you gained? You have gained nothing. I want you in heaven, and I have to do everything and anything possible to get you there. That is love, period. It involves sacrifice. We're in it together. No one goes alone, up or down. You'll take a host with you to heaven, you'll drag a host with you to hell. That's the way it is. No one goes it alone. I knew that before I was ordained a priest. But I can tell you that since I've been ordained a priest, with each passing day, I become more and more painfully aware of it. I can't make it without you. You've got to pray for us. You've got to pray for your priest. And you can't make it without us. We're in it together. We're in this combat together. Judgment. Who is the judge? Jesus is the just judge. All judgment is given over to the Son. Jesus said to them, I solemnly assure you, the Son cannot do anything by himself. He can do only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son, and everything the Father does, he shows him. Yes, to your great wonderment, he will show him even greater works than these. Indeed, just as the Father raises the dead and grants life, so the Son grants life to those whom he wishes. The Father himself judges, judges no one, but has assigned all judgment to the Son so that all men may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who refuses to honor the Son refuses to honor the Father who sent him. I solemnly assure you, the man who hears my word and has faith in him who sent me possesses eternal life. He does not come under condemnation, but has passed from death to life. I solemnly assure you, an hour is coming, has indeed come, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who have heeded it shall live. Indeed, just as the Father possesses life in himself, so has he granted it to the Son to have life in himself. The Father has given over to him power to pass judgment, because he is Son of Man. Jesus is the one who passes judgment. And he is a perfectly just and a perfectly merciful God. We have a phenomenon in progress in our age in history, and I would say even in places in the church, where we have a proliferation of sins against the Holy Spirit, which also happen to be sins against the theological virtue of hope. And these sins that I'm talking about 
at the far end of either spectrum are despair and presumption. Despair, you imagine that your sins are bigger than God's mercy. That's a sin against the Holy Spirit. That's the, that was, that's the sin of Judas. Remember what happened? Judas betrayed our Lord. What did he do? He went out and hung himself. Why? Despair. He thought there was no salvation for him. Who also betrayed the Lord? Peter. What did Peter do? He wept bitterly. And in his repentance, he received mercy. If your sins be as scarlet, they can be made whiter than snow, washed by the blood of the Lamb. If you were to take all the sin in a sinful universe, and it's horrible indeed, all of the atrocities, and they are legion, of the reign of Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, Hitler, Stalin, every brutal dictator from the beginning of time to the end. If you were to take all sin, that whole universe of sin, that avalanche of sin, that tidal wave of sin, condense it, distill it, synthesize it, horrible as it is, it would be less than a drop in the infinite ocean of God's mercy. Now that is reality. Sin is a horror, but where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. You have to believe that. So yes, there is sin, there is grace, and there is a battle, and we're caught in the middle of it. And it can be awful tough at times. At the end, when you breathe your last, and you don't know when it's going to be. Oh, some people can see it coming. They're sick. They get old. And they know more or less they're going to check out pretty quick now. That's a blessing to know that. But uh, I'm sure oh, the night of October 1st, over 30 years ago, when five high school kids set off for, for a football game in my hometown, one of them being my sister, they didn't know, four of them anyway, that that very night their life would end. They had no clue. You know not the hour or the day. At that instant, when we die, we go before the judge, Jesus. The particular judgment, part of the doctrine of the faith. You go and all of your sins are made known to you. You stand in the immediate presence of God, and in that pure light, you are made to see your sins. Now there's some question, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, held in the Summa Theologiae that man would see all of his sins, even the ones that were forgiven, all of them, so as to uh, know God's mercy. Now that's not a, uh, an element of the doctrine of the faith, but it is certainly an element of the doctrine of the faith that all of our sins that we have on our soul would be made known to us. So in other words, if you die and you have serious sin, mortal sin, on your soul, in other words, you haven't repented of that. Now some people, well, what if, what if you don't get a chance to go to confession? Well, you say an act of contrition, if there isn't time from that, even just a, a turning of the heart toward God, Lord have mercy on me, would that be enough? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. What's the disposition of the soul? Mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Mortal sin, though, unrepented of, the judgment is severe. That's the hell we shall talk about tomorrow. 
if you are perfect. In other words, you have no sins, mortal or venial, nor do you have any temporal punishment due to sin yet to be expiated. As I once told a New York Mafia chieftain, after I had baptized him, because he was convinced he'd never been baptized, although I think he had been, he, there was just no record of it. He said, well, explain it to me. What happens? You're going to baptize me. I said, well, all your sins will be washed away. All of them? I said, all of them. He said, well, it doesn't quite seem fair. He said, well, what does it mean? I said, it means if you don't commit any more sins and you die, you get on the elevator and go straight up. He said, good deal. I said, you better believe it is. Purgatory, which we'll talk about in the next hour, is the final purification. Now, you understand the particular judgment. You and I, individually, we die, we go right before Jesus. And we have to give, we have to give an account. Everything that we have done or failed to do. Everything we've done or failed to do, every word that we've spoken in anger, rash judgment, we have to answer for it. If the sins aren't, as we say, mortal. Now, do you do, you understand, just quickly, I'll give you a little refresher course. You understand the difference between a mortal sin and a venial sin. A mortal sin extinguishes the life of grace in the soul. You know the three constituent parts of a mortal sin. Grave matter, meaning the thing in itself is serious, very serious. Okay? Second, knowledge, meaning you know that is serious. And third, full consent of the will in the light of that knowledge. Those three things simultaneously have to be in place. Now, only God knows for sure if the sin is mortal, subjectively imputed. The thing in itself may be a mortal sin, but we can't make that judgment that to an individual person they've committed a mortal sin, because we don't know. We don't know all the circumstances. So that's why it says in the Bible, uh, judge not lest you be judged. Now we have to make rational judgments, moral judgments, but you don't want to go on imputing guilt to individuals for the simple reason that we can't see everything like God can, okay? But at the end, you'll have that particular judgment. Now, you know that, right? You're going to die, you're going to stand before Jesus Christ. Probably, the majority of people aren't perfect. You have to be absolutely, perfectly pure to endure the immediate vision of God. And that's why when people say, oh, I don't believe in purgatory, I say, you better believe in it. Because unless you're perfect, there's only one other choice. Purgatory is a blessing. Purgatory is wonderful. Purgatory is the mercy of God. The final purification. You remember, now, growing up in upstate New York, when I was a kid watching television, there used to be a commercial and I'm not sure what it was for, maybe Penn's oil or some kind of oil. And the guy said, the old greasy mechanic said, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. You remember that? that that's a commercial for purgatory. <laughs> yeah, it is. The temporal punishment due to sin. When we sin, two things to be aware of. It's like hammering a nail into a board. When you, when you commit a sin, it's kind of like driving a nail into your soul. It's a masochistic act, sin. Now, it could be a tack, you know, a little tack like you hang a, a, a picture, you know, a, a picture up. It's not particularly big, it doesn't make a big hole but it still makes a hole. That might be a venial sin. Or it can be a big old railroad spike. A mortal sin you hammer into your own soul. Now what happens? You, so you've got this wound. You go to confession. You repent. You receive absolution. 
the nail is removed, the guilt is taken away. What's left? A wound, a hole. The woundedness caused by sin. And it takes time. Now, the confession itself can give healing, but very often it takes time. Um, good works, uh, prayers, suffrages, and so forth, to heal those wounds. Some of those wounds, by the way, never completely go away in this life. You pass away, you go to judgment, what happens? You see God face to face. The beauty of Jesus Christ. His goodness. You have an intuitive knowledge of God's goodness, his love, his mercy for you. All the good things he gave. Right now we're kind of dull. You know, we, we don't have a full appreciation of that. But then you'll have it. But if you haven't been completely purified from the effects of sin, but you have no mortal sins, that final purification is purgatory, okay? At judgment, at that particular judgment, there are going to be one of three dispositions that the judge will confirm. And by the way, he confirms them. He doesn't hand out sentences so much as confirm what we have chosen as the result of our free will. Three possible sentences that are confirmed based upon our free will choices. Purgatory, heaven, hell. Purgatory is transitional. Everyone who goes to purgatory goes to heaven. You know that. You make it to purgatory, man, you made it. You're home free. That's great. Good thing for purgatory. Praise the Lord for purgatory. General judgment. The end of the world. Now nobody knows when the end of the world is. Even the angels don't know when the end of the world is. Remember, it seems like a lifetime ago, remember Y2K? <laughs> it's like, all the fuss and muss over Y2K. Why, we've just, we've forgotten the term. I'll bet that, had, that term hasn't come into your mind for a long time. Yeah, we, oh, we were worried, right? So a lot of people were, oh, what's going to happen? New millennium, something, something ca catastrophic could happen. Well, we don't know anything about the end of the world. You know those the ca cartoons where you got the guy with the, carrying the, the sign around, the end is near. Well, well I, I could carry one of those around and be very, very accurate. But I, I don't know a thing about the end of the world. But I know this, the end is near for you and for me. How long do you think you're going to live? 10 years, 20, 50? That's nothing. That is nothing in the context of eternity. 10 million years are less than a second in the context of eternity. How would you like to spend yours? Heaven or hell. That's the basic choice. As scripture says, two ways are set before you, O man. The way of life and the way of death. The way of truth and the way of lies. The way of light and the way of darkness. The way of good and the way of evil. Life, death. Therefore, choose life. Choose heaven. And it is a matter of our choice. We decide no one, no one has an existence which is predetermined. We have a free will. Does God know how we will end? Yes. But he leaves us free to choose from among goods. Just make sure that what you choose is from among goods and not evils. Repent if you've gone the wrong way. Uh, people often ask me, they say, Oh, Father, you had a, a big conversion, didn't you? 
that was a, what year was that, Father? 1984. Yes, that was your conversion. And I always have to stop him and say, look, my conversion is daily. I'm on the way. I have not arrived. When I get to heaven, I will have arrived. Until then, I'm on the way. In status viator, as it is in Latin, on the way. Do everything possible to stay on the right way. Jesus said there are two ways, the narrow way and the broad way. Many there are who travel on the broad way, the easy way. And that's the way to ruin perdition. Hell, in other words. Now, we don't talk much about hell nowadays, and um, that's fine with me. I don't like, I don't talk much about hell either, but it's like one time I went to a, during Lent, like this, I went to a parish some years ago, and the pastor picked me up at the airport, and he was very nervous. And I'd been preaching a few years, so my reputation preceded me somewhat. And he said, oh, Father, um, uh, my, I have good people in my parish. And I, I, re I remember, I didn't want to laugh, you know, I, I stifled myself. And he, and he said, I have good people in my parish, please don't talk about sin. And then I did burst out laughing. <laughs> and I said, well, why not? It's Lent. It's part of reality. I'm a mission preacher. You know, my ministry has been fondly t termed B and B ministries. Blast and boogie. <laughs> Hard to hit a moving target, you know. That's the tradition. Mission preachers can do things the poor parish priest can't do. People will often say to me, Oh, Father, I wish our parish priest was like you. No, you don't. <laughs> I wouldn't last a month. You'd run me out of town so fast. You can take me for a couple hours, but you wouldn't want to do it for a couple years. Take my word for it. My mission's different. I come in swinging. No, no, no niceties, no pleasantries, no how you doing, no, that's not, uh, uh come in and start swinging. Why? You want to get people's attention right away, right between the eyes. The Holy Spirit works that way. If there's something wrong, look, there's an old saying, things are received according to the mode of the receiver. In other words... People will receive a message directly proportional to their personal disposition. If I start talking about heaven and hell, and there are people there who are disposed to the truth, that message will be heavenly. But if there are people who are not well disposed for the truth, that message will be hellish. They will hate it. They'll rebel. Things are received according to the disposition of the one receiving it. Now there's a large group of people here. I don't know how many people are here. More than a thousand, I know that. I guarantee you, every one of you received the message slightly different, and it's directly proportional to where your heart is, where your mind is, where your soul is. A godly message is received by godly people, and a godly message is hellish to a person who isn't living the way they ought to be. And I could tell you story after story about that, of things that have happened. I was preaching in Erie, Pennsylvania one time, uh, just starting a novena for Our Lady of Mount Carmel, for the Carmelite nuns over there in Erie. And... Um, I, had, I was five minutes into my first talk, and I mentioned uh, something about abortion, just in passing. And a woman leaped to her feet out in the crowd and began shrieking and screaming at me. You're judging, you're judging. They literally, it was a scene right out of the gospel. She did everything but foam at the mouth. 
And they had to literally carry her out. She was furious. And then, of course, I had to give my five-minute dissertation on judgment. Judge not lest you be judged. And uh, about what that means, it really means condemn not lest you be condemned. We've got to make rational judgments and we've got to make moral judgments. But I would have, if you were a gambling man, I would have laid you a thousand to one that that woman either had had an abortion or was close to someone who had. It was a really, really sore point. And sure enough, later, that's what it was. And I spoke with her, very kindly, I might add, and she went to confession. And she loves me to this day. <laughs> As you could imagine, she opened her eyes. It's a beautiful thing, the truth, it'll set you free. So there is judgment, a particular judgment and a general judgment at the end. The Son of Man will come and all his angels with him. And he will separate them into two groups as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And the sheep he will place on his right and the goats on his left. That's the heaven and hell of the final judgment, the general judgment. How would you like the entire universe, every human being who had ever lived, to publicly and intuitively know all your sins just like that. Well, you got something to look forward to. <laughs> but remember this. And once again, St. Thomas believed, and this isn't a defined, a doctrinal thing, but St. Thomas believed that, 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 that everybody's sins would be reveal to everyone else uh, to show not not just to um, embarrass the condemned not just to give shame to the condemned but give glory to God for his mercy in other words if you've sinned and repented I, I, I try to explain this to people and once again always in, in wartime terms because I'm an old soldier I understand about that. Now we got men in combat right now. Some of them have been wounded. Some of them have been killed. The men who were wounded are not disgraced. Uh, they, those men will receive purple hearts if they, if they live, or even if they don't live. They'll, their families will receive purple hearts. That's an honor. That's, that's, a, that's a glorious thing. That's not a bad thing. In this combat, we are often wounded. It is not a disgrace to sin and repent. It gives glory to God when we repent. The sin isn't glorious, but the repentance gives glory to God. And like soldiers wounded in battle, we fight on. Desertion is the only disgrace. Though you be wounded a hundred and a thousand times, don't you dare quit. Because I personally would come to haunt you if you do. Don't you dare quit. You fall down a thousand times, you get up a thousand times. Oh, I remember my father teaching me that lesson when I was a kid, learning how to box. And I wasn't very good at it when I started either. And he put me in the ring with a kid bigger than me and he knew I was going to get beat up. And he did that on purpose, and he did it to make a point. Get up, and keep getting up. If God is for you, who can be against you? Grace abounds. Even though sin seems to be running rampant today, grace is there in even greater abundance. Remember the basics. Remember that at the end, when we die and we shall all pass from this life, immediately, instantly, we'll stand before Jesus, a just yet merciful God. 
If we have lived with him, all right, not perfectly, okay, but you did your best, you tried. You live with him, you die with him, you're going to rise with him, and you're going to reign with him. That is a promise. That is the promise of God himself. He can neither deceive nor be deceived. So there will be judgment. And you know what the judgment is based on. Do good, avoid evil. If you're wounded in combat, don't cut and run, don't quit, don't cop out. Repent, get up, and go on. And know that you have given glory to God in your repentance. And though your sins be as scarlet indeed, they can be made whiter than snow, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And then at the end, the general judgment, when Jesus and all his angels come, you'll receive what you have already received, but you'll receive it in front of every man, every woman, every child, every angel. The crown, an everlasting crown. You'll hear those beautiful words. After a race well run and a fight well fought, those beautiful words you'll hear, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, enter into the joy of your master's house. God love you.